clean and green has been in much sharper focus in recent days, weeks, and months than ever before. Now, this is manifesting in, in many different ways, and I guess this is one of the inadvertent side effects of the pandemic. Um, just by way of example, and I'll give you uh, three very uh, straightforward examples. Uh, we saw stock on the equity front, we saw stock prices of renewable energy companies dramatically rise in the, in the immediate aftermath of, uh, of the, uh, of the in immediate onset of the pandemic. And these prices have sustained. It wasn't just a fleeting uh, rise up in prices. So for example, today, Adani Green has a market capitalization well in excess of NTPCs, despite the vast differences in the size of their operating portfolios. Uh, on the debt front, the first six months of 2021 also saw more money being raised by Indian renewable energy developers in the international green bond markets. And this is important, it was in the international green bond markets. So more money in the first six months than in any previous full calendar year. And that figure, by the way, was three and a half billion dollars till, till the end of June and rising now. And finally, looking beyond India uh, internationally, one of the most notable examples that, uh, that many would have seen is that of Tesla. In July 2020, so just a few months before the pandemic hit, <clears throat> Tesla crossed Toyota in terms of market capitalization. And just three months later, in October 2020, Tesla's market capitalization had become double, twice of Toyota's. So that's really the context. And those are just a few points that highlight the context and the backdrop with which India made three different types of announcements at COP26. The first kind of announcement was an upsizing on some previous commitments. The second was an introduction of some altogether new commitments. And the third was a net zero pledge. Now, before I address them one by one, let me also point out that at COP26, India also reestablished its thought leadership by spearheading the launch of IRIS, which is a coalition of uh, SIDS, uh, small island developing states, who will be benefited with uh, technological financial supports. And this is, again, is coming in the backdrop of uh, earlier in 2019, India established the Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure to basically climate-proof infrastructure. So these are basically some of the concept of some of the context setting uh, background into, into, into sort of figuring out and describing what it is that India did uh, just last month. Now turning back to the three announcements I highlighted earlier, let's begin the first one, which is the upsizing. Now India's two principal previous commitments at uh, COP21 were that by 2030, so 2030 is the marker there, Number one, its non-fossil fuel based generating capacity would be 40% of total generating capacity. And the second was, again, by 2030, that it would reduce its emissions intensity, which is the emissions per unit of GDP, by 33 to 35% versus a 2005 base year. Um, now, the reality is that per the third biennial update report submitted by India to the UNFCCC earlier this year, so this is about Jan or Feb, if I'm not mistaken, India had already achieved a reduction in emissions intensity of about 24%. And remember, this report, while it's released in 2021, is an audit of India's 2016 emissions. In addition to that, you know, as per latest data, non-fossil fuel operating generating capacity in India, non-fossil fuel generating capacity at present is already at the 40% target, which was set for 2030. So given that one target has already been achieved, that is the non-fossil fuel uh, share of generating capacity at 40%, and the other was about 40%, sorry, 70% achieved by 2016, it should come as no surprise that both these targets were upsized or enhanced. So renewable capacity is now to represent a 50% share up from the previous 40%, Although there is a slight uh, you know, lack of clarity on renewable capacity versus uh, a definition of renewable versus or differences in renewable versus non-fossil fuel capacity, but we'll put that aside for now. The previous 40% share has been upsized to 50%. And emissions intensity reduction of, of the previous 33 to 35% has been upsized to, 40, to 45% by 2030. Um, so now this brings me to the second point, which is the altogether new commitment uh, 
uh, yeah, so this brings me to the all, altogether new commitment, which was introduced, which is that renewables would be 500 gigawatt by 2030. Now, this is an important one because the two previously mentioned commitments, emissions, intensity, and percentage share are derived, not absolute numbers, they're actually derived numbers. So it's, and, 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 and why it's important is it's actual progress on the ground that will make those two commitments happen. And nowhere is this more important than the power sector. And that's simply because the power sector by itself accounts for 40% of India's emissions. So that's why an absolute commitment is critical and why it's really important that India went beyond just enhancing its two previous commitments by introducing this third one. Um, it is useful, of course, it's important to point out that the 450 or the 500 gigawatt number, whichever one you, you, you take, uh, at least the 500 gigawatt that was announced in, in, in uh, at COP26 is not entirely new. It does sort of trace itself to the 450 gigawatt commitment or the number or the target India has set and announced domestically, but I think it carries more weight given the fact that it's the first time it's been announced and committed to at an international platform. So that's the importance of the 500 gigawatt by 2030 number. Number one, it's an absolute commitment an absolute target and the fact that it was made at an international forum. So I guess the question to ask oneself is what is required to meet this 450 or 500 gigawatt target? In my view, there are three things that need to happen. The first is that uh, DISCOM level issues need to be addressed. They need to be sorted out. You know, if you're targeting 450, 500, and by the way, when you introduce net zero by 2070, the numbers are much, much bigger. And I'll get into that a bit later. The reality is you can't have this, or you can't have this kind of growth and have it consistent with the kind of transmission distribution losses that the DISCOM system in India faces. And mind you, this is about 20% today on average. So DISCOM is nothing but a trading company. It just buys power and sells it. Imagine any trading company where you're dealing with 20% spoilage. That's just not going to be consistent and not sustainable. So the first thing that needs to happen for 500 gigawatt DISCOM issues need to be sorted out. The second thing that actually needs to happen is thermal needs to vacate some space, albeit in a calibrated way for renewables. Um, you know, the CEA, the Central Electricity Authority, their own optimal generation mix report, which envisages what the generation mix will be 2930, and which also talks about, by the way, a 450 gigawatt share of renewable energy, at the same time, also mentions a retirement for up, a retirement of up to 45 gigawatt of thermal capacity. Now, earlier, I Minakshi mean, also talked about this phase down versus, uh, you know, phase out debate, and, and 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 she raised some very important points in terms of figuring out how much this will cost. I think I just want to talk a little bit more about uh, this thermal, uh, this phase down, and just elaborate a bit and say, you know, there's about four key steps, four to five key steps that actually go down and go into defining any national decarbonization or national sort of, uh, sorry, not decarbonization, but coal phase down strategy. The first is to figure out how much coal can be retired or phased out or decommissioned. The second is how much it's gonna cost. The third is to figure out a mechanism which can accelerate it. And the fourth is to figure out well, who's gonna fund that mechanism. And from the first two points, we at CW done a significant amount of work in mapping exactly how much slack there is in the system. And we found in a report earlier this year that about, about 45 gigawatt odd um, could be shut off without really impacting generation. This is, this is basically shifting, from an efficient, shifting to an efficiency-based dispatch. On to the second point of how much does it cost, a separate report that CW authored, also uh, from July this year, actually mapped about 40% of India's uh, coal-fired generating capacity, and actually looked at payouts that would be uh, due to sources of equity debt, as well as the work workforce, if this uh, capacity were to be uh, decommissioned or retired. So, you know, there's a fair bit of progress that's been done on the first two questions, of course, the third and fourth question remains to be answered, which is, well, once you've sort of figured out how much can be retired and you figured out how much it's going to cost, you know, well, what is the mechanism that can actually make it happen and who's going to fund it? But setting that aside, 
I'll move on to the third aspect, which I think also is very, very important for 450 gigawatt or 500 gigawatt uh, target for renewables in India. And that is that the domestic bond market needs to open up as a source of funding, much more fully than it has so far. And uh, you know, at the time of construction, if you look at it, if you look at uh, renewable energy projects, solar or wind, at the time of construction, the most of them are actually financed uh, with, uh, with debt, which is sourced from domestic banks and uh, non-bank finance companies. Um, but the other side of the argument is, and there's clear evidence for this, that banks and NBFCs today don't have the headroom to finance India's 2030 generation targets by themselves. Now, our own research indicates that total exposure of Indian banks and NBFCs to the entire power sector, so not just renewables, to coal, to transmission, whatever, hydro, is about $170 billion. Contrast this with our maths, which says to achieve 2030 targets, India will need in excess of $200 billion for generation alone. So it's inconceivable that banks and non-bank finance companies, which have an exposure aggregate exposure of $170 billion will be able to muster another $200 billion in the short span of 10 years. And this is where the domestic bond markets come in. And this is why it's really important for the domestic bond markets to open up. And uh, also to understand that the domestic bond markets treat and evaluate renewable projects very differently from the international green bond markets. As I said at the outset, the international green bond markets have been extremely, extremely receptive of issuances by Indian RA developers. As I, I also mentioned that our own maths tells us that uh, revealed that three and a half billion uh, dollar number for the first uh, six months of 2021 alone. But that's not gonna be sufficient. So to recap on this, it's discom level issues. It is thermal to vacate space in a calibrated manner to allow for the 500 gigawatt and for the domestic bond market to open up. Now, finally, let me touch upon point number three, which is that pledge that India made to achieve net zero by 2070. This is also the most interesting of the three, because unlike the first two, which were almost predictable, as I said, they're almost predictable because they were already in hand in a manner, the view till even a few days before COP26 was that India was strongly opposed to announcing any such target. Now, in simple terms, net zero means a state where the amount of emissions that we put into the atmosphere are matched by carbon sinks, and these sinks could be man-made or natural, that are capable of fully absorbing them. Thus, the term net zero and not gross zero or just zero. Now, to be clear, even if every country achieves net zero, it doesn't mean that the atmosphere will suddenly be free of harmful emissions. The reason for that is emissions linger in the atmosphere for hundreds of years. So net zero is not gonna eliminate them, it's just gonna ensure that a bad situation doesn't get worse. Now net zero has in fact rapidly evolved beyond the national level context to something that even corporates are, uh, are aspiring to achieve. Uh, you know, Minakshi mentioned the, uh, the trillions or the hundreds of trillions that were uh, talked about at, uh, at COP26. And you know, this raises some really important and interesting questions on how, if at all, net zero differs uh, between country and corporate level interpretation, but that's a whole different discussion topic. I won't get deep into that right now. Safe, uh, suffice it to say for now that uh, net zero has moved beyond national level to even corporate level. But leaving at that, I just want to circle back to a report that we at CW released just a couple of weeks ago post-COP to give you a glimpse of what a net zero by 2070 India might look like. Because one thing to say, you know, India should achieve or pledges or targets to achieve net zero by 2070. It's a whole different ballgame to figure out, well, what is that net zero by 2070 India going to look like? Um, in that report, we highlighted that there are three key pillars to achieving net zero. The first is a deep renewables-based electrification. The second is a large-scale shift towards green hydrogen for industrial energy requirements. And the third is a complete shift from, uh, on the vehicle front from liquids to EVs or fuel cell-based technologies. So three big pillars for net zero for India to achieve it by 2070. But that's just the first step in terms of figuring out what the different segments are. It's even more important to actually imagine for a second what might it look like. And let me just address one data point here. 
That same report also points out that the 40 gigawatt of solar generating capacity that we have today at utility scale would need to grow to 5,600 gigawatt by 2070. That means growing almost 140 times in 50 years. It seems like a lot, but if you were to look at it from a compounding perspective, you know, remove the multiple, that's 50 years. Look at it from a look at it from a compounding perspective. It translates into growing at about 10% a year. Now that sounds a lot more reasonable than 140 times growth. And remember, 10% growth is also going to coincide with new sources of demand for power that we don't have today. That's the EVs, mobility. And it's also going to coincide with a huge shift away from coal. By the way, that report, the net zero report, also visualizes a 2070. I'm not talking about 2030 or 2040, but a 2070, which has almost no coal capacity. Now, the one thing that's clear, and I'm going to stick with net zero here, is that achieving net zero will require a huge amount of finance and capital to invest in infrastructure. Our study basically estimated and did the maths on this and estimated that the total investment requirement for the next 50 years, so from 2020 to 2070, would be in the order of $10.1 trillion, and that's in constant 2020 US dollar terms. So $10.1 trillion is the amount of money required to invest in all that solar power capacity, all the wind capacity, all the green hydrogen capacity, as well as all the manufacturing capacity to churn out these EVs. But we also estimated that conventional sources, both domestic and international, would be able to mobilize about six and a half trillion of that, leaving a gap of $3.5 trillion. And that's the gap that is important to focus on. Um, we also estimated that some sort of investment support to the tune of $1.4 trillion would be required, or actually would be sufficient possibly, to mobilize the funds that would bridge that three and a half trillion gap. So we moved on from 10.1 trillion total investment to 3.5 trillion investment gap to 1.4 trillion in terms of investment support. The number 1.4 trillion over 50 years equates to just under 30 billion on average per year for the next 50 years. And once again, out here, I'm going to weave in uh, Minakshi's point of the commitment of $100 billion per year. That was all for, all, for all countries, for all developing countries. Here, net zero for India will require, on average, $30 billion just for India. Uh, and I just want to point out that this $30 billion is on a flat number. It increases towards the end. is much less in the beginning. Um, so in closing, let me just say that India has made some very significant strides in setting targets enhancing them, as well as looking at this topic from a whole different perspective, which is absolute targets, which is net zero. On the other end of the spectrum of the targets are the investment requirements. And as just highlighted, we have a pretty good idea as to what kind of numbers those investment requirements are going to entail. Um, we also know that a big significant share of this capital can be mobilized by conventional sources, but gaps do remain, and these are significant gaps. And that's where international capital is obliged to come in and plug it. And that requirement for international capital to come in plug is not just a nice to have, it's a must have. Mm -hmm.